Hello again, Dodge here, and I am more than excited to tell each and every one of you that I, your favorite barely known YouTuber, lost the PTQ I qualified for a week and a half ago. It, uh, well, it super fucking sucked, to be honest, but it was a limited event on Magic Online, I made top 8, and the deck I piloted looked like this. How dope is that? Five playable rares. Five of them. And of course, front and center, literally, is Oko. Now, I'm not going to say it wasn't incredibly fun playing the deck, because it was. I mean, just look at it. That's a pile of value no matter what direction you're coming from. And it definitely did not disappoint. I only lost a single round to finish the Swiss portion of the tournament with a 7-1 record. And that's not too shabby. I beat an Oko Mir in the first round, which was nerve-wracking, and the match that I did lose was to another insanely fast Simic deck that I just couldn't keep up with. Now, I'm not here to talk about the losses that I took, even if the video is called How I Lost a PTQ. What I'm here to discuss is Oko, the impact he has not only on constructed formats, but limited as well, uh, and the top eight. Really, that's the crux of this video, is what happened in, to, in the top eight. Um, before we get into that for a moment, I just want to talk about Oko as if we didn't already know exactly what the card does. So, for a green, a blue, and a generic mana, we get a, what I believe scientists refer to as, metric shit ton of value. Oko Thief of Crowns comes into play with 4 loyalty and 3 abilities. The first adds 2 loyalty counters to create a food token that you can sacrifice and pay 2 generic mana into to gain 3 life. The second adds 1 loyalty counter and turns any creature or artifact on the battlefield into a 3-3 green elk with no other abilities. Finally, removing 5 loyalty counters from Oko allows for its controller to trade any creature or artifact that they control for any creature with converted mana cost 3 or less that an opponent controls. In a vacuum, these abilities may not seem like they're oppressive. In fact, I'm willing to bet that most of you watching this have seen the memes on social media about how there are, quote, 100 ways to deal with Oko and... It really isn't that bad. Let me assure you, there are not a hundred ways to deal with Oko, and the card is that bad. In fact, we could go through the list that was posted online and see what actually qualifies as a way to get rid of everyone's favorite, least favorite Fey. So, let's begin with two of the best cards that were on the list, Disdainful Stroke and Goblin Crater Maker. And actually, let's not do that, because Disdainful Stroke and Goblin Crater Maker were on that list, so it can't be taken too seriously. I mean, Disdainful Stroke entirely misses Oko, and Goblin Crater Maker may as well entirely miss Oko. But, there is some divide in the community as to whether or not Oko actually is Broko. So let's just dive into a few different scenarios involving the card and see how we could deal with it. I won't be covering every possible option, that would take way too long, I'm just going to go over the obvious and most main deckable scenarios. Now usually when you see Oko come into play, it's on turn 2 off of the back of a Gilded Goose. On the draw, that means that Oko hits the field when you, the person on the other side of the table from it, only have one mana available, assuming you didn't do anything on your own turn one. So we can start with one mana spells and just work our way around the color pie. Starting with white, there is no answer. There's nothing that white can do for a single mana that's going to deal with this card. Uh, in blue, I... You could spell pierce it, but Ixalan rotated, and that's not an option anymore. If you do want a single blue mana counter spell to deal with Oko, Mystical Dispute would do the trick. That's kind of tricky though, I mean you have to be main decking this card, which most of the time you're not going to be doing, even in a control deck. I mean, 
Teferi has kind of nerfed counter spells since Little Teferi was printed in War of the Spark, and it's understandable that you don't want to be playing a bad mana leak. Or a good mana leak, we'll say it's a bad mana leak. It typically costs an extra mana, that's not going to do it for us. If you're playing black, maybe you've got Spectre Shriek in your main deck, and you could cast that to get it out of your opponent's hand before they cast Oko. But that means that you exiled a card from your own hand, and that you're really hoping your opponent didn't have a second Oko already, or that they haven't drawn into one. If you're playing red, you could shock Oko, and that will put him right back to where he started, which is definitely not the same thing as killing him. Red cap melee is better, but that still doesn't actually kill Oko, and you're sacrificing your one and only land at that point to not kill Oko. That's not really that great. And for all of the magic players who prefer to stay on the greener side of the grass, there are also exactly zero one mana answers to the card. Now some people have brought up Veil of Summer, and that's fine, but it's not an answer, it just prevents Oko from turning your whatever into an elk, and that early in the game you would honestly probably have the 3-3, then a goose or a sloth or whatever other one mana spell you cast already. But what if we're on the play? Or what if our opponent missed their turn one dork? Well, if we continue our way around the color wheel in Magic, we arrive back at white, which has nothing it can do about Oko turn two. Blue gets negate, which does what we want it to, and that it keeps Oko off the battlefield, and that's fine. For two mana in black, we have access to the Elder Spell and Noxious Grasp. Both of these are decent ways to get rid of it, they're not going to be able to stop that first activation, and playing the Elder Spell early is going to make us lose that extra bit of advantage that it provides in adding loyalty counters to our own Planeswalkers, but that's okay, we really just want to kill the Thief of Crowns. When we get to red, we find cards like Scorching Dragon Friar and Fry, neither of which will get rid of Oko the turn it comes in, and that's a problem. But we don't want to be spending a bunch of spells trying to get rid of a single card. Green has nothing that it can do. But for a universal solution, there is always Sorcerer's Spyglass, which will shut down Oko's from that point forward, or at least... Maybe it stops them after Oko has had his first activation, and that's something. It's definitely not nothing. Continuing on, we get to three mana, and things get a lot better when it comes to options. White has cards like the Prison Realm. Blue has basically all of its counter magic. Black has cards like Murderous Rider, and Murderous Rider is really, really good. Green again, has nothing it can do, and of course I skipped red here, but honestly red just has more burn spells that aren't going to do enough damage to get Oko off of the field. And there are multicolor cards like Absorb and Bedevil which will counter or kill an Oko, but by the time we get to three mana, if our opponent already has Oko on the field, odds are that it's creating a lot of serious advantage for them, and maybe they've found another one to replace the Oko that we are finally capable of getting rid of. Even if we lean on our creatures, there isn't a lot in standard that will kill Oko before the opponent can recover and restabilize, or just turn our best threats into much less threatening elks, or blank them by making elks of their own, or trade useless food tokens for them. Even under the absolute best circumstances, one early Oko will create at minimum a couple of food tokens, and six life is often more than enough to give them the time to find another one before the game is over. Now, as always is the case whenever a powerful new creature or planeswalker enters the format, we see a lot of people say things like, well, if you just kill the goose on turn one, and then they have to play Oko on curve, and you can kill it with something else before it takes over the game, or 
play X and Y and then Z isn't even a problem. But these lines of thinking are incredibly flawed because they assume that you're always going to have your answers in hand and that your opponent won't have any way to protect whatever it is you're killing and that while you're dedicating so many different resources towards dealing with a single threat, your opponent isn't doing anything else that's relevant. Sure. You could live in Magic Christmas Land, where you shock into Noxious Grasp, into Murderous Rider, and it feels like you're on top of the world, but what happens when you don't draw any of your own threats? What about when your opponent floods the board with something other than the one card you built your entire deck around beating? Or when you've spent so much time worrying about the fast midrange strategies that you're just not able to keep up against aggro or control decks? Sure, you're going to have a handful of matches where you draw your nut hand or your opponent falters, and that's great, but those matches are few and far between, and they are in no way a barometer for how good your deck actually is. Now, all of these things I've mentioned are talking points that focus on constructed formats, where there are, as we know, at least a hundred options available to deal with Oko. But the PTQ that was the impetus for this video in the first place was limited, so if you come up against an Oko or similarly powerful and difficult to remove card in a sealed or draft event, where you have little to no control over what will be available for you to fight against those cards, where do we end up? There were multiple games in the Swiss rounds of that tournament that I absolutely would have lost if it weren't for Oko, because when you can gain life, build an antlered army, shrink your opponent's best creatures, or trade your worst permanents for their most mediocre to best permanents, all provided by a single card that is obnoxiously hard to kill, it is really, really hard to lose. Even in a key game and next to the last round of the tournament where I miscalculated how I was supposed to handle the situation and ended up minus fiving my Oko to death just to take control of a cheap flyer, I won. And there was basically nothing my opponent could have reasonably done about it. In fact, in the first round of the event, the one where I played against another deck that also had Oko in it, my opponent decided to spam the chat box with trash talk about how my deck was bad, I was bad, and Oko was the only reason I ran away with the match. And maybe they were right. Maybe there was a bit of truth to the vitriol that they were filling the chat box with. And you know what? I'm gonna say that absolutely there was some truth to that. Full stop. Because Oko is Broko. In fact, Oko was so good that I had this to say about the card in the top 8 draft. Oh my god, if we see an Oko for the draft, do we just fucking hate draft it? I think so. Oh, that would feel so shitty. But yeah, I think we would fucking do that. I think... I think that makes sense. Like, what else could possibly be... Normally, you know, you don't want to hate draft anything unless there's literally nothing in your colors for the pack and you're already dedicated uh, to a deck. But also, normally, there aren't mythics that come down turn three with no ramp and can't be gotten rid of. Or can't reasonably be gotten rid of. Like, if we had to play against an Oko, we'd probably just lose, no matter what we draw, right? Even if we are able to kill it, it takes like two, three turns. I mean, yeah, we had Oko in our sealed pool, and uh, even the times when we lost it, or minus fived it to death, or whatever, uh, we just one. I think there was maybe one or two individual games where we didn't win with Oko. And then this happened. Well, fuck. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. This is exactly what I was fucking talking about. The dragon's awesome. The dragon does not beat Oka. Burning Yard Trainer's great. It does not beat Oka. Elite Headhunter is not very good, actually. I don't, I don't super like that card. Red Cap, again, it's okay. It's not fantastic right now. We're not really uh, supplementing it with anything. So, yeah, we just fucking hate Draft the Oko because in the off chance we see it, we cannot beat it. This is what my final draft deck ended up looking like in the top 8. It isn't particularly pretty, but I've gone 3-0 with worse in Throne of Eldraine drafts, and I believe that if I had been paired up against something other than Mono White Aggro, I probably could have stood a very real chance of getting past the first round. Of course, had I known that I would be seeing an Oko in Pack 2, I probably would have taken the Fabero Elder in Pack 1 for my first pick, Though, to be honest, I'm not even sure that that would have been enough to get me the win if my matchup in round 1 had been the same. Even with the deck that I did draft, if I had taken the dragon over Oko, there's no way I would have been able to get it on the field before I was completely dead on board. And in any but the absolute best case scenario, if I had been paired up against an Oko deck, I would have lost. So, was my decision the correct one? Under almost any other circumstances, I would say, no, fuck no, you did the wrong thing, you fucked up, you're stupid. But this is a little bit different. Now, I'm not a fan of, nor am I a proponent of hate drafting. There are way too many things that have to happen to make it a viable strategy. You have to be paired up against the person who took the card you would have cut off. They have to draw it. They have to resolve it. And you need to not have any answers for it. That's a lot of things to go wrong to make hate drafting right. All of this to say that it is very, very rarely ever going to happen. And very, very rarely is there ever going to be a card that will single-handedly beat basically any deck at any point in the game as soon as it hits the table. But Oko is that card. He is so much that card that he's creeping towards Jace Friend's Prodigy price range when that card was in standard, and online it's even more expensive. When Throne of Eldraine first released on Magic Online, Oko was around 30 bucks. At the time of the PTQ, he was sitting near 60, and I sold the two that I pulled for 54 bucks each. As of right now, a week and a half or so later, he's back around the $60, $70 range, but within the time span between now and the Pro Tour qualifier, or Players Tour qualifier, whatever we're calling them now, he spiked to almost a hundred fucking dollars on Magic Online. I wouldn't be surprised if he worked his way back up there if the card isn't banned after the Mythic Championship coming up. That would not surprise me at all. Because it is that powerful, and we're in a standard format where playing three drops on turn two is entirely viable. Now, I'm not making this video just to say that Oko should be banned. Although he probably should be, and I won't be surprised if he is at some point in the near future. And of course, there's always going to be something else that comes along and takes his place as the objectively best card in standard. Because there's always going to be an objectively best card in standard, or almost always at least. But how often is the best card in standard capable of doing so much, for so little, and also be so incredibly difficult to remove once it lands? So, let me know what you think in the comments. I'm really interested to hear what you all would have done had you been in my seat in that draft. And remember, if you like the video, hit the subscribe button. And if you didn't, well, what the fuck are you still doing here? Go outside or something, you mook. Dodge here, one more time, just wanted to say thank you so, so much for checking out the channel. If you're enjoying this content, please like, share, subscribe. Anything other than a thumbs down is going to help so, so much. 
I assure you, more than you can possibly imagine. It also just means a lot to me, and hey, I might not be doing this for clout or fame or whatever else, but it is nice to know that there are people enjoying the work that I'm doing, because at the end of the day, if nobody was paying attention, I'd probably still be doing it, but I wouldn't enjoy doing it as much as I do, knowing that someone out there is getting something from it. Again, thanks.